Like if we want to go to the bylaws. Hi, Marie. Can you hear us? Can you hear us? You're on mute. I, yeah, I was unmuting okay. myself. Yeah, I okay. can hear you. Okay, perfect. Thank you. All right, Mr. Chair, it is 5.30. Okay, cool. <clears throat> um, okay, it's 5.30, uh, August 6, 2024. Let's call this uh, Ward 3 NAB uh, meeting to order. We'll uh, start with roll call. Uh, Ilya Arbertman? Here. Gabriel Maya? Here. Marie Rodriguez? Here. Thank you. Zachary Bolton? Absent at this time. Jarrett Singh, absent at this time. And then Shonda Golden. Here. Thank you. Mr. Chair, you have a quorum of the Ward 3 Neighborhood Advisory Board meeting. Okay, and let's move into item A2, public comment. Yes, Mr. Chair. Our first item today is public comment. Members of the public may hear, observe, and provide public comment virtually by registering through the following link, which can be found on the reno.gov forward slash meetings portal. And the link is as follows. H-T-T-P-S semicolon forward slash forward slash l i n k s period r e n o dot g o v forward slash four one capital e capital k p u eight it should be noted for those in attendance that comments are to be addressed to the board as a whole comments heard under this item will be limited to three minutes per person and may pertain to matters both on and off the agenda the board may not take action upon any matter not agendized on today's agenda when you are called for public comment, please state your name for the record and begin speaking. The timer will begin when you say your name and you will be afforded three minutes. At this time, Mr. Chair, I have not received in public public comment and or see anyone on Zoom. If you would like to give public comment via Zoom, please raise your hand. You will use the raise hand feature at the bottom of your screen. And seeing none, Mr. Chair. Okay, we'll move on to A3 um, to approve today's agenda, which is a short one. Do I have a motion to approve? I'll make a motion. Do I have a second? I'll second. Cool, all in favor? Aye. 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 Motion passes, agenda is approved. And then in our packet, we've got minutes from our last meeting um, in June. Uh, let me know whenever someone has a motion to approve those. Give my for the record, motion to approve. Hurry, Rodriguez, I'll second. Okay, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Um, motion passes, the minutes are approved, and we'll move on to A5. We have Council Member Martinez here with uh, uh, today's council report. Yes, good afternoon. Thank you all again. Uh, for being here serving, I always want to make sure I start and lead off with that. Appreciate all your time and your efforts, whether it's Zoom or in person. Appreciate you all being here. I just wanted to give a couple of updates um, with what has happened over the last couple of weeks on the City Council. Um, I think in, in particular to what's happened in Ward 3, 
I don't know if any of you have driven near Yori, but the sidewalk has been installed and they're already putting down the pavement and the asphalt. So it's looking really good over there. And I also just met with Adam Searcy from the Washoe County School District. And we talked about the upgrades to Vaughn Middle School and the progress there and the future plans that were just approved from the Capital Protection Committee through the Washoe County School District yesterday. Uh, no, Thursday of last week, uh, to go forward with the design and the upgrades to uh, Wooster Elementary School, Stead Elementary School, and um, Echo Loader Elementary School. So two of those uh, which are located within Ward 3 will be seeing modernization happening to those facilities in the coming year. So excited about those progresses and what's happening there. <clears throat> so council member Ilya for the record, yep. Ilya Arbeman for the record, Wooster High School or a different elementary Worcester school? Wooster High School. Oh, sorry. Yeah, yeah Wooster High School is on the list. Um, and there's gonna be some more public comments or statements and input coming from the school district to talk about uh, Pine uh, Middle School, Smithridge Elementary School, um, and Corbett, Roger Corbett, um, and Vaughn with those, all those upgrades and, and what we're going to do there. So look forward to those conversations and input from the neighborhood advisory board on those and how you all want us to move forward on some of those things. So yeah, those are all the only updates that I had for today and happy to answer any questions or any comments that you all may have. Any questions for council member Martinez from the board? Uh, good reminder for the record, uh, necessarily a question, but uh, I do want to express my gratitude towards you and the city council for, you know, saying those long nights the last couple of weeks, you know, shows that you guys are uh, dedicated, specifically you, you're always trying to uh, do your best and even with your injury or your situation going on, uh, you're still coming in every day to work and I do appreciate that. Thank you for the, yeah, I know we've had <laughs> long agenda items and um uh looking forward to continuing to the, do the work for our community and for those on zoom i i had to get uh my quad tendon reconstructed uh so you can't kind of tell what's going on but i appreciate that thank you Graber. all right thank you so much thanks we'll move on to a6 abby staff report uh no update for me just happy to see y'all i hope you guys had a good month off so thank y'all for being here cool Okay, we'll move straight into business here. We have a couple RPD um, reps here. So let's move on to item B1, uh, update from RPD. Thank you, Captain Larson, uh, for the record. I appreciate you guys having us here as always. It's been a long time. I don't think I've been doing that meeting in like 15 years. So when they asked me to do this tonight, I'm a little out of my comfort zone. So forgive me if uh, I mess anything up here. From what I understand, we typically go over the crime stats. Um, as you can see, trending from May to June, uh, we're trending down. I went and talked to our analyst before I came over. She said that trend is continuing um, through the month of July, so you should see that as well. What I did want to touch on, though, is just some of the cooperative efforts we are doing with the city of Reno, in particular the clean and safe team um, in that Yori Park area. Just wanted to remind you that we do go out there monthly, clean up the area, look for abandoned vehicles, post cars, look for those nuisance. And while we're out there, we always take that opportunity um, to provide out, outreach and resources to um, the community and the families in those areas. Um, we also did 166 graffiti abatements um, in Ward 3 over the last month. Um, so those are kind of some of the highlights. Is there anything that you guys are looking for in particular or anything I can answer um, that you guys might have particular questions on? Yeah, Ilya Arberman, for the record, I have a question um, if you could offer any insight. Um, it came up at last week's council meeting, but it was shelved for a couple of weeks on the potential uh, railroad trespassing ordinance. I know it's coming, Chief. Have you been in more of those meetings? The, uh, there was a railroad ordinance brought before council. Um, so the last council meeting, and I'm not sure if I think that was passed. Um, no, it wasn't. They, um, they, there was a noticing error, so they pushed it back two weeks, and that would have been the first re reading anyway. But I'm I'm asking more for the RPD perspective on that, um, as far as 
thoughts on, you know, we haven't had an ordinance like this in the past. Why is, you know, how are we going to enforce trespassing within a hundred feet of the tracks, et cetera? Yeah. So that's always been an issue, right? Is like where, who owns that, that area in between the tracks and city of Reno property, um, whether or not we have jurisdiction over it. Um, my understanding of this ordinance, it does, will give us that jurisdiction we need. I think it's like a hundred feet or a hundred yards. It's, it's pretty lengthy. So it's going to be a big help to us in order. I don't know if you've ever see when you're on the Wells overpass, you look down, we have a lot of um, unhoused encampments in that area. That will give us the ability without um, Union Pacific to go up and help clean out those areas. So it will be a big help to us. How have you guys been cleaning out those areas? We usually work with the city, work with Union Pacific. Um, they try to um, go out in conjunction with Union Pacific. Otherwise, you're just out there um, asking for their um, cooperativeness. Um, to move out of those areas and try to, again, always at offering people resources when we have that opportunity. Yeah, um, yeah, I guess my question is, you know, over the past few years, that area gets swept of encampments pretty regularly. Um, and there hasn't been an ordinance on the books. So I'm just, I think, I think some people are kind of curious as to how, um, why the ordinance is necessary, you know, what, what, what the issues have been, because it seems like there hasn't really been from an outside perspective, an issue with getting people, sweeping people off the tracks when, you know, when well, you choose to do That means we're so. doing a good job, right? If it looks looks like we're, we're being effective out there. But yeah, it's always that coordination with Union Pacific and working through other um, uh, city and county um, ordinances to help get people those resources and get them to move along off, off those areas. And there's also um, some health and safety um, ordinances that we're able to use that create issues so we can move them using some of those health and safety issues through Washoe County. The, um, the ordinance, part of the ordinance is in reference to people walking along the tracks, all those rocks, erosion, things like that. The more traffic, foot traffic, whatever is being brought through there creates an issue with that the rocks that that's built on. It erodes away. So that's part of the issue, the safety along the railroad tracks. Um, UP, at Union Pacific, we've had, had several meetings with them and they are doing 12 cleanups a year with us to fund those. So we're, we're, we have a strong collaborative effort with them at this point. But basically that walking along the railroad tracks, it, there's a lot of problems with the erosion and the maintenance with that. And that's part of the, the issues. Yeah, I mean, but <clears throat> I, I'm kind of still, the question isn't quite being answered as far as why is the, or it is private property, correct? That portion of, there's a section of that track is Union Pacific, and there's a section of it that is a city of the city, and it's measured from the outside rail out, and I forget if it's a, a hundred feet, uh, two hundred feet, something like that. And then parts of it is city, parts of it is Union Pacific. Mm -hmm. But so if it's private property, the parts that are Union Pacific, existing trespassing ordinances would cover that, correct? They, the, the ordinance is made to allow us to do the work there without having to ha have them come out. Yes. Oh, so without having UP come out. Well, I'm just wondering if it is private property and people are trespassing, hypothetically, like any other private property, you would be able to enforce no trespassing there, correct? Yeah, they, they post it, which uh, allow, they post it, they give us the permission to, uh, to enforce it. So this is part of the ordinance as well. Because we can't go out and just trespass people. If, if you know it's your house, I can't just trespass mm -hmm. people. I have to have you there. So it allows UP not to be on site. It allows us to take action without, without them to be them. physically there. Gotcha. Um, and as far as um, sort of in the larger scheme of you know sweeping encampments um, around uh, around the city in general, because like I said. The people that have been staying there, people that are walking there, you know, it's not like they've been um, allowed to stay there in the past, right? They do continually get swept. So how do you guys see this ordinance changing that pattern going forward? Because from what I've seen, people kind of leave and then they come back and then they leave and then they come back. Um, why will this ordinance make or how will this ordinance break that pattern? The ordinance is just going to allow us to continue to go out there and now we can cite if they're on the tracks for this particular violation. So it's going to give us a little bit more of an enforcement angle on that. 
but it also, it, again, it's allowing us to get out there more. They're going to move around. They, 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 they're transient in the fact that they're looking for a place to stay. So they'll find a place there. And then when we come or we get the complaints or we see this, we go move them out. Then they'll move. They move somewhere else, right? And then we go move them. That's, that's it's just, it's, it's cyclical in, mm -hmm. in that nature. Um, we're doing the best that we can with uh, what we can do. But this ordinance is just going to firm up the um, the ability for us to do enforcement along the railroad tracks. A lot of it's safety. Again, they get out there along the railroad tracks as trains are moving along. So it's going to allow us up further onto the railroad tracks. Um, and, you know, because you're sort of acknowledging the, the cyclical nature of it, in other words, that this isn't probably going to address any of the root causes or get people um into housing, hypothetically, right? If well, you, every time we're out there, we're always looking for that person who's willing to take that help because we certainly have resources we mm -hmm. want to get them in, and it's those resource resistant people that we really want to get, yeah, to get yeah. into that health, get that long term help. That right. Well, on the, at the city council meeting, the same one that um, that this ordinance was going to be discussed at, but it got kicked down the road a couple weeks. Right? There was some a statistic from the downtown Reno partnership, right? That was sort of citing. Um, you know, interactions with people that the ambassadors were having. And there was an interesting statistic there where it said, like, this is how many people we spoke to, 47 in the month of June. This is how many people uh, um, took outreach services. The number was zero. And then how many people didn't? And the number was 47. So I think that a lot of people are kind of wondering, <clears throat> without that other piece of the puzzle there, um, what are we doing here with the ordinances, right? If we can't actually get people to break out of that cycle of moving around, like you're saying, we can cite them more readily, but then what happens? Well, I mean, that's a good question. If you we have that solution. <laughs> we, we can't force them to take the, the outreach that we're offering, mm -hmm. but if they are in violation of certain laws, we can take action on that. At some point, they're going to have to make their own decision. Or are they going to continue down the path of, Maybe they end up with multiple tickets, things like that, or they're going to take the outreach that that we want them to have. We want we want them to get the help, right? And we're offering them all the resources. We just can't force them to do those things. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, that's we're doing the best that we can. These folks, if if they want the help, we're happy to give it, but we can't force them to take the help. Yeah. But if they're doing things that are illegal, they're on people's private property, things like that. We also have an obligation to help those the folks that people are on their property, whether it's UP or a, a, a business down there along the tracks. It allows us to help them get those folks out of their off their property, out of their property. The messes that are made, the hazards that are left behind, things like that <laughs> allows us to go down there and do work for those folks as well. And do, do you guys feel hopeful that this ordinance is going to change the situation on the ground we're always yeah, hopeful that always these hope. these are that's the idea we're hoping that this is going to help but it gives us a tool to right. try to help help the folks that are down there with the people that are on their uh, their property we interact and we try to help the folks that are on the property mm -hmm. and and we're doing the best that we can with that um and just one kind of Final sort of question about that. I'm curious on the law from the law enforcement perspective when people talk about ordinances like this one and the camping ban and this, you know, sleeping in your car and RV ban, and people sort of put that under the under the general umbrella of criminalizing homelessness. What's sort of the law enforcement response when people make that um, kind of use that language to describe what these ordinances do? I think that we're criminalizing homelessness. So I that's that's not what this is about. So. No, and I think the Supreme Court case that came out with Boise, I think that kind of um, speaks that same, right? We're not we're not criminalizing it. We're enforcing the laws on the books and and we're holding people accountable. Yep. Right. Um, but as you're saying, as far as the cycle goes, right, if we're if we admit that, that we don't really have anywhere else for people to go, I think what everyone is trying to figure out is where where what yes. how are we gonna break this cycle here. And if it looks like criminalizing homelessness and sounds like criminalizing homelessness, then I think we need something more substantial to feel like that's not what's happening. Yeah. Like, like the chief was saying, we're always offering resources and it just, it may take, you know, a hundred times offering the resources and it 
we'll get them to, to accept those resources and we'll we'll break that cycle. That's we're always hopeful to break that cycle. When why do you guys think things have been getting worse? Sorry? Why do you guys think things have been getting worse as far as you know from about four or five years ago to now? Right. There's more people definitely living. I, 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 say, I, I think it's now. the the movement of people to our area. Absolutely. It just brings more people. And you know, you have a hundred people and three percent are homeless. You have two hundred six percent. It's just going to increase your numbers. Okay. Well, I'll be at that city council meeting, so we'll see how it goes. You know, it's it's really interesting. Like when I first started policing, um, I think the numbers were just the opposite. You know, eighty percent accepted our help. Maybe ninety percent accepted our help. You know, everyone was looking, and it's just it's a weird dynamic over the the twenty six years. Yeah, I think we're all trying to figure that that one out. Absolutely. We all need to work together. Yep. hundred percent. Okay. Sorry for taking up everyone's time <laughs> nope. here, but. All right. Any other questions? I have a question. Um, give my for the record. So I live on Spring Drive. So right behind McCarran. And for the longest time, especially during the summer, you would hear all those cars, motorcycles, and everybody just racing down those number. Uh, you got about both sides. You got Veterans Parkway on one side, and yeah, on the other. and so um, I have noticed that there's been a huge reduction in those events. I don't know; they occur once in a while, not as redundant as they used to be. Um, is what do you guys? Uh, is it just between the partnerships between Washoe County Sheriff Sheriff's Office and RPD, and trying to get more uh, operations to to sting them, or what do you think? Well, what's the overall? Or both with the ordinances that kicked in also not that long ago, you think that also helped out uh, to reduce uh, uh, basically st uh, street racing and racing. stuff like that? Yeah, I, I think so. And, and we listen, right? We A lot of people call in and they put it on Reno Direct. So we really do listen. We get the traffic officers out there and really hammer it. Um, you know, show of force is always good. So the more, more times you see cops out there, the less likely you are to get that. Um, I grew up in Hidden Valley, so I'm very familiar with the area. So I, I, I feel for you. We have we have people that live out there. But yeah, it's just working with Washoe County NHP. Um, really, Veterans Parkway is a regional effort to to try to keep tabs on on the the speed out there and keep it under control. But yeah, it's just it's just attacking it, you know, and, and keeping keeping that presence out there. Okay. And uh, with that, um, I'm assuming there has been a lot of increase in uh, impounding vehicles of that nature, or is it? basically giving out citations, stuff like that, that people have been scared of, do you think? Right right now, it's mostly the citations. Um, we try to do some of the impounding when we can. Um, the laws are very specific. We actually are talking about um, going to a couple classes for equipment violations that will help us um, not necessarily impound the vehicles, but then when they re-register, they have to have those equipment violations fixed. Um, we're taking some leads from uh, California and from Las Vegas on how they're doing it. And we're actually working with that program with NHP right now on trying to schedule um, that training on what officers need to look for um, to do those equipment violations. Oh, okay. Very good. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much. Maria you. Rodriguez, for the record. Um, Good seeing you, Maria. Hi. I <laughs> um, don't want to take up too much of your time, I know. Um, but I just wanted to maybe talk a little bit about the walking assignments that started this summer um, in the downtown area and the camera program. Um, I, from what I've been hearing, a lot of people have been responding really in a positive way to seeing that presence downtown. Can we talk a little bit about that and how it's going? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so council made it an initiative that we wanted to get more walking beats, uh, increase our, our what used to be called the downtown enforcement team, um, working with the ambassadors. So we moved that to where we're going to have a day shift met team. Now we're calling it the mobile enforcement team because they're going to be a hybrid of walking and on bikes um, with that swing shift team. So we're a greater coverage area getting out there for the public to see, being able to out, ask questions, um, working with the ambassador program that's down there um, collaboratively um, to respond to what the, the wishes and needs of downtown are. Um, as far as the camera program you're talking about, it's the FUSIS program, um, a great program. It's a, it's a program where citizens can um, link in, share video with the police station. Uh, business can, businesses can also, um, with their cameras, they, currently have can allow police access on 
um, when they choose. So it's not like we have 24 seven monitoring, but if that business allows us to have access, um, we can have access to those cameras, which really creates, right? We're looking for that um, wide field of view so we can, we can more adaptively look at what the city is doing. Um, when a crime occurs, we can more quickly look to see if it was caught on camera, what cameras may be out there. So as that grows, um, the program really is really big in Atlanta. Uh, we watch theirs huge. It's 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 very easy to to see what what happens and occurs. And then this will also kind of letting a little bit of the cat out of the bag as we get our um, drone program or unmanned area vehicle program off the ground um, to have. Uh, UAVs as first responders. So all those cameras eventually will intertwine and it just gives us a, a, a better global view of what's happening in the city. Um, really excited. A lot of the businesses that have come on, we have some, some businesses downtown that have come on. We have some businesses in the South that have come on. It's been a great program, a, a, a great collaboration between the department and the private business. Does that yeah. answer what you're looking for, Marie? Yep, thank you. And thank you. I, I know you help, you help push it out there, so we appreciate that. Shonda, you got anything? You're like the only one so far. Oh, uh, how's Paradise Park coming along? I was over there. I was Shonda Golden for the record. Paradise Park. It looked like there were a lot of homeless in there in the park again. Yeah, um, I, that kind of goes back to that that cyclic nature, right? We we work on um, moving them out. The the thing with Paradise, right? It's right on the border, so we really got to make sure we're working with Sparks Hope's team. Um, when we work those areas so we can give them those resources and try to get them moved um, to resources as opposed to just the cyclic nature of moving them around. Okay, thank you. Absolutely. Well, thank you guys for having me. You got another one? Go on. Another quick question. Sorry about that. Um, uh, I might have this information mixed up, but um, I uh, saw online uh, an article about uh, Sparks implemented a... Um, a machine that could detect uh, basically any ballistic uh, shots, shootings and stuff like that. Um, is there anything that would uh, RPD be looking to uh, uh, getting acquiring a similar system for, for Reno? What area will be like the more, um, the more that happens more often per se? Um, so we have talked about it right now. We're just kind of watching Sparks program. We're working with them to see how it works. Um, we're evaluating it to see if that's something that the city um, could use. Um, are the conversations happening? Yeah. Is there any um, serious push right now? We're just in that conversation phase about seeing um, if it would work for us here. Okay. Do we, uh, do you guys, have you guys seen any kind of trends going up and as far as uh, specifically with firearms, anything like that that's charging? Well, um, that's crimes and stuff like that. Well, I think you always see that the firearms crimes go up in the summertime just because there's it's people are outside more, right? Um, what we what we have done is we're getting ready to stand up um, a, a crime gun initiative program again. Um, we worked it really hard the last couple of years, so we're looking to take that program and uh, move it further. Get another dedicated um, officer with the ATF so that we can work directly with um, their resources so that we can be more informed and work works from these gun crimes better. Last year, I think we had 140 plus gun C, so we're looking to try to get stay in that, that number. It's been very effective. It's a very great um, program. Uh, our regional gang unit is on board with it. Like I said, we're looking at standing up another, another officer with the ATF to, uh, to really push that program forward. Okay, thank you very much. Well, thank you guys, I appreciate it. Thanks guys. Okay, I'll move into B2. I think Nathan's here for uh, parks capital improvements. All right, yes, sir. Uh, thank you, Chair and uh, Ward 3 NAB members. Um, Nathan Oliott, Parks and Recreation Director for the record, uh, here today to, to give a little presentation about what we have coming over the next year plus for uh, capital improvement and capital maintenance projects in around the city, but also with a special look at a few projects in Ward 3. Um, so I think I can use my clicker here. I think I can, I did. Did it work or was that you? Was that you, Wizard of Oz over there? Yes, all right, we're active. 
Um, so I wanted to start out by kind of explaining, uh, we've been kind of on a tour with the Finance Advisory Board, Rec and Parks Commission, talking about residential construction tax. I think it's important that people know that the funding mechanism that we have through development uh, for new parks um, is this residential construction tax, and it's very limited and limiting in our ability to build uh, new parks. Um, so uh, that's a part of this conversation that, that's important when we talk about the, the projects and funding source that we're working on this year. So um, RCT, residential construction tax, uh, has been in place for many, many years as this mechanism. Um, and the last substantive change was in 1987, where they moved the cap to 1,000 or 1% 1 per dwelling unit uh, with the permit. Um, back then, average listing price was 75,000. Um, it peaked at, or it capped at uh, in 1995, where that average listing price was 100,000. So that's when we started getting uh, $1,000 per home to build a park. So uh, some of the allowed uses are new construction um, or to improve and expand existing parks with amenities. Uh, there's some restrictions on the size it can be. So I know one of the projects you may have heard of uh, that would be in Ward 3 would be the Pembroke Flatfield project. Um, we would not be able to use residential construction tax to build that because that project would be, exceed 25 acres. So just trying to paint a picture here that uh, it's a challenging uh, mechanism that uh, has restricted our ability to build new things even though development continues. Um, so you can see there are just some statistics there about um, the median price per acre was uh, to develop parkland has increased about 530% from 1990 to 2023. Yeah, again, we have not changed the cap on how much we get per home as it's built. Um, so meanwhile, the median home uh, price has increased by uh, almost 1,000% in that same time, and yet we haven't changed that RCT. So uh, some, some pictures at the bottom, which are beyond my skill. Uh, some staff put that together to just kind of explain. It cost us 55000 per acre back then, and then the home price is there uh, at seventy five, and then as it grew over time. So got more expensive to build. Mechanism didn't grow with that. So uh, for an example, in 1987, it took 1,750 homes worth of funding or $1,000 RCT to develop 31 and a half acres. Um, so in, in 2023 with uh, Lakeview, uh, which is a, a park in another area that I, I use as a comp, uh, would it need 7,400 homes to build a 10 acre property. So again, just trying to paint a picture that it's, um, it's not working to build new parks. So. A few more descriptive pieces there. You can see Virginia Lake um, way back in 87, 31 acres developed uh, at, at 17 or 1.7 million. If you go down to Cyan, which is relatively new, um, that cost per acre went up to half a million. And then uh, for the secondary components of it, the phase two, only 316,000 per acre. So the amount of homes we need to build to, to meet our acreage is, is significantly higher. I just wanted to share some of the balances. This is important. Uh, these districts are not lined up with the wards. So um, just, just for, for your knowledge, District 4 is primarily covering Ward 3. So a lot of the funding that we'll talk about in the projects for Ward 3 is coming from that District 4 bucket. Makes sense. That's where a lot of growth has been is in South and, and uh, East Reno. And uh, Ward or District 4 covers much of um, essentially east of Virginia, but then north up until uh, all the way up towards the 80. Um, so this is just an idea of in the last 10 years, this is how much uh, if we had one single district, if it was just Reno and one big bucket, we would have 25 million in 10 years developed through RCT. Um, and again, one of the restrictions is that you have to spend it in the area that it's developed, which makes sense. Um, but it also limits the ability to um, combine funding sources to build larger assets for a regional benefit. All right. So with that, uh, I just wanted to kind of lay that lay that out for you. I think it's important that people understand what, what we're working with. Um, so this is the first year, I believe, in a while where we've taken significant steps to access RCT. It's just never really been enough to build a new park, but we've kind of waited for it to be. Um, so this year, we kind of made some some choices and decisions with um, our uh, with the Rec and Parks Commission to to say, hey, let's start accessing this funding and 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 upgrade and improve our parks that we have currently, so that at least we're bringing some benefit to the community rather than uh, leaving this in a rainy day fund when it's already raining. So uh, as you can see, there, Sky Country Park is in Northwest Mayors and Mecklenburg Parks in the North Valleys, um, Mariloma Park, which I know you all are very familiar with, um, and is a great space and just needs some love. 
Um, we're going to put some significant investment into the tennis courts, reconfiguring for pickleball, turn the, what is kind of a, um, mockery of a basketball court and turn it into a real basketball court. Um, and then also improve some of the paths and lighting in the space too. So that's, that's a big piece there. Um, as well as, as a part of the other funding mechanism that we have, uh, improve the skate park, do some repairs in the skate park. There's cracks that you could fall in and, you know, find another, you know, inner crust world. Probably they're so wide. So doing some basic, uh, repairs that we need to in that space. Uh, Wilkinson's also in, um, the RCT district four, uh, it's not in, I don't believe it's in ward three, uh, maybe, I think it's in ward one. Um, it's in three. is it in three? Okay. So Wilkinson park is another one that's going to receive some significant attention, including a new playground, a dog park, uh, and things like that. Um, and then double diamond is, is another space, but I, is double diamond in three or is that in two? I think that's in, I think that's in two. So, uh, but that is in district four. So we are going to access that funding to, uh, improve those parks. Um, and then here's some capital maintenance funding, which is another fund that council has really made an effort to improve over the last three years, especially to increase the ability to just replace things that are designed to wear out, improve irrigation systems that are wasting water, um, and take a lot of money to keep mandating a lot of time and money. Um, so you can see there are some, uh, some projects getting done. So additional money going to Mira Loma and Comstock for, for playground safety services, um, some, let's see. Um, and then down there at Miguel Rivera Park, the playground replacement. One thing we are fortunate and it does help impact Ward 3 is the CDBG funding, which uh, is helping to build, uh, rebuild the Miguel Rivera Park playground. It's also helped to um, with, uh, with half of the cost of the Wilkinson Park improvements. So that's another funding source we have and, and council has been very uh, aggressive in directing that towards park improvements over the last several years as well. So here's just a quick snapshot of what we're going to do uh, at Mira Loma here in the next, uh, we're hoping to do it before the winter. It may be a spring build, um, but by next summer, uh, coming into a space that has new resurfaced courts. If you've been to Mira Loma, those courts are atrocious. Um, it's embarrassing. So uh, it's nice to see that we're going to be able to take some steps over the next year. Um, and then down to the, uh, let me see, what's the best way I can use the mouse, right? I can point a laser at it and then I can see it, but I already know what I'm looking at. So in that area right there is the, um, the kind of current basketball and handball court. And it's kind of just an in-between space. That's not really, um, if it's utilized, it's utilized more for basketball, but it's kind of just not a great space to play basketball. So, uh, our goal there is to build a full court basketball court and then take some of the handball elements and put that into the tennis area so that they would have a wall to play off to. So if there are people that that's important to, we'd still have some, some ability to do that. Um, so here's a layout that we're looking at. We're actually going to the pickleball community and then to our rec and parks commission to see if we want eight courts that are pretty tight, or should we go with six little more spacious courts um, and then keeping two tennis courts for, for the tennis community as well. Um, so we're going to be, bringing those designs to the uh, August 20th Rec and Parks Commission meeting. And then here's just a schematic of the basketball court showing a full court, which again, if you've seen it, you, you know what I'm talking about. It's not really a usable space and it's kind of a cage, so it's hard to have a game in there. Um, so next thing, uh, Broadhead Park, right downtown on the river. Um, Ilya, I heard your presentation last week. This is one of the things that we're talking about bringing to that space. Uh, to try to get some activation in that space and also bring some fitness along the river uh, for folks to hopefully move down there, get a workout in. You know, if they're walking from far away or they're walking just from the apartments along the river, they can get a workout in that, that has no cost, but they have uh, essentially a personal trainer. Now here I'm going to expose my technology gap. Will this video play? Welcome. Oh, did the you watch? Fitness Court is the world's best outdoor gym Where? designed by the National Fitness Campaign in San Francisco. I'm Rob Richards, one yeah, of your fitness trainers. I'm so glad to see you. We're building hundreds of fitness courts across oh, the nation. Good to hear from Australia. Daily wellness practice so, in your neighborhood, yeah. which will improve your health, We're Englishman, I'm happiness, not okay. and well, longevity. We don't need to watch it again. Fitness but here's a, a video Health of the court. Providers and uh, local cities and schools they are in. I've got some pictures. Best of all, it's yeah, outdoors, in the sunshine and fresh air. Oh, there we go. So here's some images of the court there. And if you've already seen the video, great. Um, it's, it's very cool in, in that it has an app that connects with it. So people can track their workouts. They can also compete on times and, and uh, it'll show them how to do the exercises and things like that. So it's, it's very um, independent for use, but you can also engage as a community in the space. 
um, and it's very durable. Uh, the, the equipment, there's not much that moves other than the rings. Um, and if something needs to be replaced, the floors, the, the tiles along the floor can be replaced relatively easily. Um, some of the equipment, uh, the rings are the one thing in my experience that have had to be replaced because they, you know, they're fun for kids and everybody else too. So, um, but everything else is replaced relatively easily without having to close the rest of the space. Uh, there's not a lot of moving parts. It's about body movement. Whereas some of the other, uh, you may be familiar with Greenfield and some of the other items, those things break. And if, and if they're not moving there, don't, they don't do the work for you. So, uh, we're hoping to have that going in here in the next few months. So we'll make sure to get information out to the, to the NAB here, uh, and invite y'all down for that. Okay. And then just also some urban forestry. Um, also, I'm sure you're pretty aware of the airway, the airway improvement that we've got a grant for $500,000 for to improve that uh, space and adding a ton of trees along that roadway, which will be a fantastic thing, the irrigation system as well. And then it also allows us to improve our, um, our uh, greenhouse, which uh, we do some amazing things considering the condition of that space. And uh, so to be able to improve that will allow us to grow, grow some trees on our own um, that we may be able to get to try in a space that might be better than, than what's growing naturally. And so that we have a little diversity in our tree cover. So, um, anyway, with that, that's just a quick update of, about, uh, what's going on in, in CIP and capital improvement for the parks department. There's some smaller things. Um, I know Shanna's on here. So one of the things we're looking at, it's a smaller number, but putting netting up near the, uh, uh, soccer pitch that's on the uh, rancho side of the the entrance to Paradise Park, so so that it'll be a little more usable space for the folks at night, and they'll use that other court that the ball won't go flying into rancho and uh, things like that. So there's some small improvements on that side too, in addition to the awesome playground that just got uh, activated and put in over the last several months. So, all right, with that, if there's any questions, um, Sean, Sean, you're going for the record. I just wanted to tell you that uh, Paradise Park, it the children are using that playground, and it's such a blessing to see that. So I'm very grateful. Thank you for all the hard work. You were one of the last questions. You're, you're welcome. I, I shouldn't get much credit for it, but it is an awesome playground, and it's great to see that when you put good things in spaces, people use them, and they feel safe in those spaces, too, because other people are with them. And Shanda, just going back to your question for PD, um, we, we are in the process of hiring two more rangers that will allow us to have seven day coverage in that park, which should okay. help uh, the footholds from getting taken over the weekend. We work real hard all week to um, keep it a space that's inviting. And then uh, on the weekend, sometimes we lose track of that. So uh, having, having seven day coverage, I think will help with that piece too. Perfect. Thank you. You're welcome. Hi, Marie Rodriguez for the record. Um, yeah, we did enjoy that presentation of the Broadhead um, Fitness Center a while back. Um, but I thought of something as I was watching it this time around. I know that it says that it originates originated in San Francisco where the weather is vastly different than most of the country. Um, and since it is an outdoor facility, how well will that equipment and especially like the ground cover, which um, you're talking about could be replaced. Will that hold up with a place, especially like here, where we have all four seasons and such extreme different types of weather conditions? Sure. Yeah. Um, it's a, it's a great question, a great point. So I can definitely speak to the heat because I had one in uh, Phoenix, Arizona. And so it did okay with the heat. It'll be interesting uh, if it gets a lot of water and then freezes, what that will do, I think that would be the bigger question. Um, but they are all over the country, including, and then also in Canada, Minnesota, places like that. So I think it does pretty well there too. Um, it, it does have warranted coverage up front. And then it is, again, it's relatively easy to replace, but um, it's going to be interesting to see. And in the winter months, how many people use it and things like that. But um, they've been a great, relatively low uh, impact to a, from a maintenance side, um, improvement that's, uh, you know, primarily not primarily, but partially funded through grants. And, uh, if it goes well here, we're also putting one into uh, DeMonte ranch park. We've got, uh, if it goes well, we're planning on taking one to mayors and McClendon park and, uh, also paradise and, uh, picket park. So we've got some other spaces that we're looking to bring them at. So there's a little more of a network and a little more of a regional acceptance. There's already one in San Rafael and then another sparks park 
uh, that has them as well. So we're hoping to make it a little bit of part of our fabric. So I think the one in talking with Sparks is held up well. Um, I don't know that it has some of the same uh, traffic that we'll probably get at Broadhead, um, but uh, the San Rafael one's also held up pretty well. So I think we're okay there, but it's always interesting to see, especially being really close to the river. Um, the parts that are metal, like the rings and things that they pull up, um, are they the same kind of material? Like when we were kids and all the playground equipment was metal and in the summer when they had this 90 degree weather, it would burn <laughs> or is it something that is, um, resistant to that? Yeah, again, in Phoenix, uh, it was utilized typically like anything in Phoenix in the summer, it was, uh, it's utilized when it's the sun goes down. So I think direct sun's going to heat anything, but, um, it's, it doesn't get really any warmer than some of the kind of ceramic or plastic pieces that are out there too. So, um, uh, it's got, it's got that kind of paint reducing coating on it. So, um, and plus it's got great recover in that area too, which is great. Uh, we don't have to really even put a shade on it, but, um, yeah, I think people will still make choices on when and, and how to use it for sure. If it is a little bit too warm for them. Awesome. Looking forward to it. Thanks, Nathan. All right. Thank Quick you. question. Oh, sure. um, for the August 20th meeting, what time does it start? Uh, it starts at six. It'll be at, uh, right now it's scheduled for McKinley. We are going to see if we could do it at Moana, but um, I don't think we're going to be uh, confident in the tech yet. So to do a public meeting there. So it'll be at McKinley at 6 PM on the 20th. Okay. Tuesday. Another quick question. Uh, you mentioned as far as uh, maintenance and all that kind of stuff. Um, is there money put us and uh, well, you mentioned that there's warranty and all that fun stuff, but, um, is there another, uh, another bucket put aside for the uh, maintenance that com could come up as far as to be able to replace us in a timely manner for, for the courts? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. I mean, I think it's, it's a relatively insignificant amount and there, and we do carry a budget for repairs and replacements and, the nice thing is, is that this is a very active company, whereas I know you've probably heard of challenges with our slide replacements that take a very long time to get fabricated and replaced. They hold these parts on on uh, and can be delivered within a week. So, um, And none of the individual parts are significantly expensive. Okay. Awesome. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Okay, I'll move on to B3. Um, this pertains to us directly, the NAB resolution update. Hello, good evening. Hi, uh, everyone. I'm Jenica Finnegan. I'm the Council Relations Manager for the City of Reno. And so I'm here today to brief you on a proposed update um, for the NAB resolution that we will be bringing to Council uh, likely in September. I'll let Ms. Mayorga pull up our presentation here. I go. Okay, so here's just a little background on the history of NABs. Um, they came about in 94. There have been a couple of updates to the resolution, uh, one in 2014, 15, and 17. Uh, in 2023, Council adopted the ordinance uh, to create a six ward. Uh, as such, we need to update the NAB resolution. So I'll be going to all of the NABs uh, in August to present uh, this presentation and then likely bring it to Council in September for them to consider a new resolution uh, ahead of the new ward boundaries going into, into effect uh, in November. Oh. Okay. So here uh, uh, is an overview of some of the topics of change that we staff is proposing to the resolution. The first one is the effective date of the resolution, uh, ensuring that the resolution goes into effect at the same time as the new ward boundaries. Um, the second piece is to create the sixth ward, um, ensuring that each ward is represented by a neighborhood advisory board. Uh, the third one there is to update the ward map, uh, reflecting the new city ward map in the resolution. Uh, the last one there is the impact of transition to six wards on the neighborhood advisory board. So that is clarifying term limits, eligibility, and transition plans for sitting members. 
So staff is recommending that if you are a sitting member, um, you are able to finish out your term. If you have changed wards, you would be able to resign from your current ward and then apply through the regular process. So we can look through the different scenarios here. Uh, so new ward boundaries go into effect. If you, I'll start on, let's see, this side. If you live in a different ward, you, uh, after the boundaries go into effect and you want to serve on a different NAB, you would submit a resignation to the current NAB and then apply to serve on the desired NAB uh, that represents your, your address. Uh, if you live in a different ward and you want to continue to serve on this NAB, uh, you're eligible to continue serving on your NAB for the remainder of your term. Uh, if you live in the same ward, nothing changes, you're eligible to continue out uh, serving your term. If you have any questions about whether your ward has changed, I'm happy to go through that with you afterwards as well. Uh, after taking a deep dive at the resolution, we also noted some um, opportunities to clarify this resolution. Uh, so these are some functional changes that staff is proposing. The first one uh, is regarding eligibility requirements. Uh, this would clarify some language. Uh, staff's recommending that while if you serve on a NAB, you would be able to serve on another city of Reno board, but you wouldn't be able to serve on two neighborhood advisory boards at the same time. Uh, the second one, alternate member provisions. This just clarifies the rules regarding alternates. If you are an alternate, we're recommending that alternates go to council for approval should you desire to become a full member of the body. Uh, the third one, absence removal clause. This is essentially a no call, no show clause. Uh, staff's recommending to ensure that uh, NABs are able to meet regularly uh, and have quorum, that if a member doesn't come three times in a row, they may be able to be removed. Uh, if they are absent six times, even though they let us know, they also may be able to be removed. Um, as a reminder, everyone on neighborhood advisory boards serves at the pleasure of the council member. And so that's just uh, an opportunity for us to remind NAB members of, um, you know, their participation in the board is expected and um, we value your opinions and want to make sure that it's an active, active group and body. Um, the next one is the applicability of RMC 2.20. Um, so as public appointees, uh, NAB members are subject to, to our ethics uh, per Reno Municipal Code. Uh, the last one, presiding officer selection responsibilities. This just creates consistency across all NABs, adding language um, for a rotating chair and vice chair. We're recommending that NABs select uh, the first regularly scheduled meeting of the year, uh, a chair and vice chair for that year. Lastly, we have some uh, administrative changes and cleanup. Um, these are in line with some of our other boards and commissions at the city of Reno. Uh, so we're recommending to remove gendered language, uh, combine provisions related to development projects. Right now, the current resolution has, I think, three different sections where it talks about development projects. Um, same with alternates. It's in six different sections, actually. Um, so just making sure that uh, we go through the resolution, organizing it topically for, for clarity. Um, clarifying language related to term limits, uh, resignation protocol, submitting uh, something in writing to your staff liaison, uh, clarifying that service on the NAB is uncompensated. We pulled this from the HRC, I believe, uh, and then outlining the duties of the chair and vice chair as presiding officers, clarifying agenda creation process, and adding some legal disclaimers. So I am happy to hear any feedback uh, or answer any questions for you all. And here's my contact if you'd like to submit any written comments for us to take back to council. Any questions from the board? Right now, is there no provision for chair and vice chair rotation? I mean, we haven't done any. We don't even have a vice chair. And that's why we want to add it. To the, to the new resolution um, to ensure that there's a little bit more consistency across the NABs and that it's laid out in a clear process for you. Gotcha. Any questions? Oh, it's gone twice. All right. Thank you all. Actually, I have a quick question. Sure. I, was, I was just waiting for the people online. Um, <clears throat> the RMC 2.20 mm -hmm. uh, for the public appointees, where can we find that information? Uh, we're ha I'm happy to have Abby send it out to the body um, afterwards, and then 
get you a link to it. You yeah. can also, yeah, Gabriel, you can just search Reno Municipal Code and put in that and it'll come up. Oh, you, okay. Yeah, there's a there's an online uh, portal for that stuff. Oh, sweet deal. Okay. Just want to make sure yeah. that. We'll okay. make it easy and send it to you. <laughs> so you'll have it for future reference as well. Marie, you got a question? Uh, yes, I was having trouble with my mute when I was minimized. Um, when are you taking this before city council at the next yep. meeting? We're expected to take it um, in September. So I'll visit all of the August NABs uh, to get feedback from each board and then take it in September. Okay. Yeah, I think you said that earlier. Thanks. Okay. Of course. All right. Thanks very much. Thank you. Okay. That's it for business. Um, moving on to C&D. Any announcements from the board? Okay. Well, um, Yep, sorry, yeah, sorry, go ahead. Um, just wanted to let you guys know, um, I know that we have quite a few vacancies and I've actually been talking to some of my neighbors and others, um, friends and family, and possibly might have a couple of people uh, applying to maybe help take care of some of these vacancies. And just a reminder that um, next Monday is the first day of school, so... Um, just reminding everybody to be on the lookout for that and looking at our school zones. I know that um, the city's been working hard to kind of improve our crosswalks for the kids. And that's kind of all I have today. Thanks, Marie. Okay, moving to E, if there's any public comment, I doubt there'll be any here. And I don't know if anyone's on the Zoom there, Abby. Uh, seeing none on Zoom, uh, if you would like to give public comment, now would be the time. Seeing none, Mr. Chair. Okay, do I have a motion to adjourn today's meeting? I'll make a motion that we adjourn. Do I have a second? Give it my for the record, I second. Okay, all in favor? Aye. 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 Meeting's adjourned. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.